which means nobody's going to get to hear my rant about the F-35. Oh, well. All right, so now we're recording, and Sherry, you got to remind me to give you extra credit point. Sure thing, thanks. All right, so now what did we learn last time? Yeah, how to design for people, right? And so not just the average, but what is the variability, right? We want to design for 95% of the population, understanding those um, circumstances under which that may be appropriate or trying to design for the 75th percentile or things like that. What else? Um, one of the key factors into determining human size seems to be more military driven. We have more data points with the military than we do with actual civilians, which can kind of skew. Yeah, exactly. It's so much easier for us to get that military data because part of the in-processing is getting all those measurements, right? And so a lot of our understanding about the averages for uh, human beings comes from that military population. And so there is going to be a little bit of a selection bias for that. Um, but we do try to extend those models to the civilian population. Good. What else? Yeah, various different types of measurements. Seated and standing. What else? I like the part about the link analysis where yeah. designing like things or things that get used uh, either in a sequence or just together are put to where you can, you know, it's designed so that that is easily accessible. Exactly. Yeah. So if we have four controls and you use A and C a lot together, kind of A and B, but B and D a lot together. Right? Maybe it makes sense to now put A and C close to each other and then B and D close to each other, right? Because if the width of this connection is how frequently you jump from one to the other, you're wasting a lot of time by going cross room like this or cross instrument panel like that. And so you can reorganize the uh, display, the controls, et cetera, in a much more useful manner. Questions about what we covered last time? Awesome. What do you have a week from Thursday? Exam, yes, perfect, good. All right, here's your fun fact of the day. Bananas are curved because they try to grow towards the sun. What about them apples? Or bananas, rather. All right. So today we're starting off by talking about the musculoskeletal system, right? A lot of what we're going to be talking about um, today, Thursday, and maybe next week. Um, is kind of the biomechanics of work, right? We've already talked a little bit about the measuring of the body, but now we're going to be talking about the actual biomechanics, right? And so when we talk about the musculoskeletal system, we're talking about bones, muscles, and connective tissues. Those connective tissues are things like ligaments, tendons, fascia, cartilage, etc. Right? And so when we think about muscles, muscles are very much like a fiber cable, right? You have, if you think to any big suspension bridge, you see those long, big cables with a bunch of little cables running within them and so on. That's very analogous to what our muscle actually is, right? And so you have within your uh, muscles, we'll talk about that kind of outer sheath, right, that's connecting everything together. 
you have connective tissue within those fibers, and then you have muscle cell bodies within that, right? And so when we exercise, what's happening is each one of these fibers is contracting, right? Muscles never push. Muscles are always contracting, and they can contract in opposite directions. So when I'm pulling my arm up like this, my bicep's contracting. When I'm pushing my arm down like this, my bicep's relaxing, and my tricep is contracting. All right, and so the exercise of muscles, when we're actually building muscle, what's happening is we are tearing down these muscle fibers and building them back up um, after that damage to the tissue. So obviously within our skeletal system, this is what we look like, right? We'll talk about the different bones and the joints themselves that connect, but each muscle is connected at points to the bones, right? And actual overexertion can tear that muscle off the bone. And so y'all may have heard of stories, you know, the fable is always the mom who lifts the car off of their child, but there are a lot of stories of people who get like momentary superhuman strength. And so we actually possess strengths far greater than what we're able to consciously call access to. But one of the reasons we tend not to use it is because it's inherently damaging to these kind of connective tendons, right? So the examples wherein people are lifting superhuman levels of weight typically result in substantial damage to the musculoskeletal system. Right, there's one example I saw back on National Geographic years ago, I think it was National Geo, um, of a climber who was kind of walking along the face of a mountain uh, with shale and a big shale sheet, I always struggle with saying that, shale sheet fell off and landed on him. And he started kind of sliding back towards the edge of the cliff they tried to estimate, based off of his report of the size of that sheet, how much it would weigh, and they thought over a thousand pounds, between a thousand and two thousand pounds. And according to those who were around him, he actually bench pressed it off and over his head as he was sliding towards that cliff. Now, of course, removed substantial amounts of muscle from his skeletal system, but again, we have these muscle fibers that when they contract, are putting pressure on these connective areas, but those are what is allowing us to move our bones around. Right, but it's not just the actual muscle. You can see you have all sorts of ligaments inherent, for example, in your hand, right? The ligaments that allow you to move your finger up and down, those aren't muscles, those are just ligaments that are connecting the bones together. And then for our joints, we have several different types of joints. So I can move, there we go. Several different types of joints. One would be a plane joint. So you can think about the plane joint as being the joint between the vertebrae in your spine, right? You have bone on top, bone on the bottom. And then in between, we have fluid filled sacs that allow it to move around. And so what they do when they fuse your spine, if you've ever heard of spinal fusion, is they literally just put a rod in between those bones to prevent that joint from moving around. You have a saddle joint, and that saddle joint is like what you have for your wrist, right? It allows movement up and down, but kind of side to side as well. You have a hinge joint, and the hinge joint would be more like what you have in your knee. I don't know if I can get away far enough here to show for people on camera, but just moving back and forth, right? It's hinging on that point of your knee. Ball and socket, right? That's what you have in your shoulder or in your hip. The ellipsoid joint, which is what allows your head to move up and down, side to side. It's gonna be side to side like that. 
And then the pivot joint is what allows you to move your head back and forth like that. And so all of these are combining into the musculoskeletal system. There we go. And so in your body, you have 206 bones that change our structure, size, shape, density, over time for a variety of reasons, but also because of load put on the bones. There's a reason Ronnie Coleman, former bodybuilder, could squat over 800 pounds because he built up to that. If I tried to put 800 pounds on my back, I would likely snap my femur, right? But you also have changes in shape over time as a function of age. And so at every joint, you have two or more bones connected to each other. Those joints could either be a synovial joint, right? So no tissue exists, but it's a highly lubricated joint, right? So that would be like your ball socket moving around in there. Fibrous joints, so for example, connecting the bones of the skull with fibrous tissue, so like your jaw. And then you have cartilaginous, right? Or using cartilage. Or other things like your discs between your spinal joints. And joints can be no mobility joints, right? And so if you think about the seam of your skull, that's two separate bone plates coming together. However, if all things go well in your development, they fuse together and stop moving. You can have a hinge joint, right? So we talked about kind of that hinge so just where you have motion in one plane, right? So my elbow is only allowing me to move up and down. You have pivot joints that allow you to move two degrees of freedom. So for example, up and down and left to right. Right, your ability to get circular movement in your wrist is a function of different um, expressions of those two degrees of freedom. But you can only move in iterations of up and down, side to side. And then you have joints that have three degrees of freedom, right? So your shoulder or your hip, right? So I can move up and down, I can move side to side, and I can rotate it around without moving anything in there. So when I say degrees of freedom, that simply means essentially directions it can move. Questions so far about any of this? Pretty straightforward. Cool. 
So you have about 700 muscles in the human body, which accounts for roughly half your body weight. Of course, that was probably pre-COVID for all of us. Now my gut, I think, accounts for probably a good third of my body weight. And they account for about half of your energy consumption. The more you use the muscles, though, the more energy they are consuming. Right? This is one of the reasons why weightlifting, even if you're not getting your cardiovascular system working all that much more, can still burn calories because of the amount of energy associated with exercising those muscles. That's why me standing up for class is burning more calories than me sitting down because the variety of muscles required to maintain posture and a standing position is requiring energy consumption. So like I said, they're made from bundles of nerve fibers, connective tissues, and nerves. And those nerves are what's sending signals to your brain about the expression of that muscle. All right, so is it contracted? Can I feel it contract? So you have both efferent and efferent, right? So that distinction does make sense if I don't write it down. But you have fibers that go from your brain to your muscle and from your muscle to your brain. Efferent with an E is exiting your brain. Think of it that way, out to the muscle. Efferent with an A is back up to the brain. And so, as I said, the first day of class, I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, right? And one of the principles of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is trying to put people in positions that hurt or would do damage, right? And so there are a variety of different types of what we call submissions, but one of them would be like what we call an arm lock, right? or an arm bar. So the idea is that somebody would put a fulcrum underneath my elbow and stretch out my arm. And when that happens, I can feel stretching and pain signals coming from my muscle saying I'm being hyperextended, right? That's that nerve fiber saying, whoa, let's stop this. This isn't gonna be good. But you tend not to have those nerve fibers on various ligaments, like your MCL or ACL. And that's why when people tear their MCL or ACL, there's not always pain associated with it. They just notice that they've got a lack of stability in those actual joints. So those nerve fibers are sending signals about the muscles, not necessarily about the other connective tissue. So like I said, those muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells. Again, think kind of those big um, cables for suspension bridges, consisting of those contracting elements. And what's contracting are those myofibrils. All right, so we're gonna talk about various models of movement, things like recommended weightlifting limits. So when a body's not in motion, we can describe it as being in a state of static equilibrium. All right, so we'll show an example in just a second of somebody holding a weight straight out. We're using that static model to understand the various forces on the body. So again, static models are assuming no movement whatsoever in the body or the various body segments.
So here is an example of a single segment planar static model, wherein you can see all the different forces expressed by somebody holding, we'll call this a dumbbell over here. See the fulcrum is right at that point where the two bones connect. You have a certain force, which is represented by the mass of this dumbbell. You have that direction of force. And if you go back to high school physics, you remember closer you get to the fulcrum, the less force exhibited or it would be necessary to equate what you have at the end of that fulcrum. And so you can see that the muscle fibers are contracting up to try and counteract this dumbbell. Right, so the further away you get from that fulcrum, the harder it's gonna to be to continue to hold up whatever you've got. Right, we all conceptually know this, right? If I hold my iPad in here close to my body, it's a lot easier than holding it all the way out here for any extended period of time. The same amount of weight, but again, I'm getting further away from that fulcrum. And so there are going to be a variety of things we're going to talk about today which can contribute to those lower back injuries, right? But if you think about the fact that the further away you get from something, the more force is required to maintain its position in space. If I'm lifting something from the ground and the pivot is my hip, that's a lot of pressure that my low back is now having to express to move my head up and down. All right? So lower back injuries are one of the most prevalent and costly forms of musculoskeletal disorders in industry. They account for about one third of all worker comp claims and cost an estimate estimated between 30 and 66 billion dollars in the US alone every year. So again, I'm sure you all have heard at some point in your life, don't lift with your back, lift with your knees. It's the idea of squatting down to pick something up rather than bending over at the hips because bending over at the hips is creating that tension at your low back to pull you back up. And we'll talk about that force in just a second here. And so you can actually calculate that load as a function of the horizontal distance from the load you're picking up to a disc in the back. And B, the horizontal distance from the center of the mass of the torso to that disc. And then we can calculate what would be the rotational movement that has to be counteracted by the back muscles
accordingly. And we will show an example of this in just a second here. Now, does this cover anything, you know, <clears throat> I know um, working in retail, you know, it's you lift with your legs, not your back, but there's also, you know, you don't want to twist because the torso can twist while you're lifting and that yes. can cause all kinds of tears in the back. Yes. Yeah. We will talk about that in just a second, but yeah, you are absolutely right. Um, <laughs> which always reminds me of my favorite scene from Family Guy where he's talking about lifting heavy things. And he says, the key to lifting any heavy thing is lift with your legs straight in an upward jerking motion with your back. Yes, don't do that. Yeah, there are a whole bunch of things that are gonna contribute here. Right, and so that muscle force required to create that movement be calculated accordingly. And if we were to create a circumstance wherein somebody had to lift whoops, there are, something with a horizontal distance from that load you're lifting to a disc in the back of 40 centimeters, right, a foot and a half. That's not that far away from your body. And B, 20 centimeters, so from your center of mass to that disc. We find that the force required by the muscle is about eight times the load weight and four times the torso weight combined. All right, so you can see how increasing the amount you are lifting can dramatically increase the amount of pressure on your low back. One of the biggest problems of this is that that force, let me, this is gonna be somebody's spine. Just pretend this is very anatomically correct. If somebody is lifting, right, those muscles are contracting on their back, but because these are discs and not a stable static bone, it's putting pressure on these fluid filled sacs between, we call them discs, between each of your vertebrae. And at the extremes, that's where you can start getting things like ruptured discs. So essentially these fluid filled discs break like a balloon. You could also have a slip disc, right? So the pressure forces that disc essentially out the back or out the front. All right, so when you think about all this pressure that your back is having to exert to lift even just a light weight, you can start to see why you start getting low back problems when the pivots down here, all that pressure is being put on that low back. And so we can actually calculate how much you should be lifting We can calculate how much you should be lifting with this recommended weight limit equation. 
And that recommended weight limit is task specific, right? And so it's saying for a normie, normie, for a normal healthy worker, what could you lift without an increased risk of low back injury? All right, we'll go over each one of these multipliers in just a second. But when you start doing this equation, you start getting stupidly low numbers. And I say stupidly low numbers off of my own bias. But I remember when I did this back in graduate school, we were calculating what the recommended weight limit would be for a task of lifting a box up, just a normal box up from the floor. And I don't remember the exact specifics, and it's obviously going to differ based off of how high you're lifting it, things like that, that we'll go over in just a minute. But it's something like 10 pounds. Right? You shouldn't be lifting over 10 pounds from the floor. So what are all of these components? Well, LC is just the load constant. Right? It's the maximum recommended weight for lifting under optimal conditions. So it's essentially a max, right? So it would be symmetric lifting. So you don't have something that's asymmetrical or kind of clunky. You're not trying to lift a sofa. It's kind of rocking back and forth and putting side pressure on you. With, as Denny said, no twisting. Keeping yourself as static as possible. Occasional lifting, right? So one of the issues you'll run into is fatigue, right? Very repetitious lifts even if low weight can cause injury. With good coupling, what we mean by coupling is just essentially good handholds, and less than 25 centimeters of vertical lifting. Right, so we're talking about eight inches about of vertical lifting. So that's our load constant. That's under ideal circumstances, what's the most we could lift? And now everything hereafter is reducing that amount. So the first thing we have is a horizontal multiplier, which is just reflecting that disc compression force increases as the horizontal distance between the load and the spine increases. Right? The closer that load is to my trunk, to my torso, to my spine, the better. The further I get out, the more pressure it's going to require on my back. All right? So the further away that load gets, the less I should lift. We then have a vertical multiplier. And this means that the assumption, the resting assumption, again, under these ideal lifting circumstances, is that what you're lifting is about 30 inches off the ground. So basically, your dining room table. Lifting from the floor or lifting from higher up is more physically taxing and thus will reduce the amount you can lift. You then have a distance multiplier. So the further you have to lift something, the less that thing should weigh. You then have an asymmetric multiplier, right? So when you have something that is requiring some degree of twisting or kind of asymmetry in what you're lifting, 
that should dramatically reduce the weight as well. Right? Because you're getting into a problem anytime you are providing your body with asymmetric loads on it, that's when things start getting hairy. A frequency multiplier. So how often are you doing this? I think your body or your book. Um, what in the world am I talking about? I think your book talks about um, what those trade-offs are. Right? And there are actual numbers you can go in to plug in and get those recommended weight uh, limits, but I'm not going to have you all do that. I just want you to be conceptually familiar with this. And then that coupling multiplier. So it takes into consideration whether that load has appropriate handles or coupling. All right, so you can think about something that has a good handle that's inherently easy to grab, make full use of your grip. Things like a normal box where you're having to kind of apply more pressure with your hands so you don't have a good grasp on the system or on the uh, weight itself reduces that risk, or excuse me, reduces that weight, increases that risk, et cetera. So once you plug all of that in, you'll get your recommended weight limits. And from there, we can analyze different lifts in a workplace environment. And so we would put the actual lift over that recommended weight limit and get that lifting index. And you can start to see the relative risks, right? So if you are staying at or below that recommended weight limit, there is very, very low risk of a low back injury. You start getting over one, the recommendation is that you're paying attention to any sort of kind of extreme postures that somebody may take. As you approach two, as you approach doubling that weight limit, there's strong recommendations to redesigning the tasks and workplaces. All right, anything above two, you're just asking for a back injury. All right, and so you can go around and actually analyze various lifting tasks, right? This would be good for, you know, any sort of warehouse environment or assembly line, right? Where you can start and figure out, okay, if I as a worker have to reach across the table to pick something up to bring it to towards me, how much more am I... Um, lifting than I should be lifting and what is that doing to increase the risk of low back injury right and so again as with everything in human factors you can start making a uh, recommendation to companies based off of the costs to the employer based off of um, things like comp days they're having to pay out uh, worker dissatisfaction right being in pain significantly decreases happiness, which decreases productivity, etc. right? So it's all connected together. Questions about anything we've covered so far today? All right. So on the feedback I got after the first exam, one of the things that came up was wanting more extra credit. And so what we're going to do today, I normally do this as an in-class thing, but because the damn Rona, um, we are going to do it in a virtual capacity. So let's pretend that I'm opening up a chain of grocery stores called Nate's Ergonomically Friendly Grocery. 
But to have this title, I need the best design checkout stations in the world. Knowing what we covered today, what we covered here, I want you each, if you want the extra credit, to work to design and draw the most ergonomically safe checkout station for both the customer and for that employee. And so what I've done is put a discussion thread on uh, Canvas. You can see that. And so I would encourage y'all to actually physically draw it and then you can take a picture and upload that. But I think this will be a good opportunity for you to start putting into practice some of these ideas, hint, hint. Yeah. Um, I think I made it till Friday. Yep. So to incentivize y'all to actually do this activity, because I think it would be good practice in addition, we're gonna go ahead and end class here. So feel free to take the rest of class to actually start putting that together. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing what y'all come up with. Last year, we had some incredibly creative designs, including, I think, essentially catapults. So um, if y'all can come up with something great, we can take it to Trader Joe's when they decide to come here in a year or so, whenever they're coming, and uh, change the way Trader Joe's does business. So, all right, I will hang out here if y'all have any other questions. Otherwise, I can't wait to see what y'all come up with. Hey, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, I just have a, I just really had a comment, uh, not a question, but a comment. Um, mm -hmm. For a good for a good five minutes, I forgot what class I was in. So, I was, <laughs> you know, because we're we're going I, we're going over things I, I didn't expect to uh, go over in this class. So, like yes. I said, it's not it's just a something I had to share. No, absolutely. Well, it's one of the things I like so much about human factors of. You kind of have to be a jack of all trades, at least to some degree, right? You have to know a little bit of anatomy, a little bit of psychology, a little right. bit of engineering, a little bit of computer science. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is so far out of my wheelhouse of expertise, or sometimes when I'm teaching it, I'm like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be teaching in class because right, right. musculoskeletal system isn't something I'm familiar with, but. All right. Yep.